I'm going to talk about the foundations of Western civilization, the components of our current discourse, and how these are bringing us into a very difficult and perhaps fatal situation. I'll rely a lot on an argument from Carolyn Merchant um, in a book called Reinventing Eden, where she claims, and make, correctly claims, I think, that humanity, particularly in Western culture, is trying to retake our place in paradise from which we were expelled uh, in the process of the fall. The picture behind me is, in some ways, the quintessential expression of Western culture. Uh, but it is a, a picture that holds us captive. It sees us as separate from and above nature. And it sets the stage for um, the Baconian project, the project to retake our place in paradise, formulated by Francis Bacon uh, around the year 16, 1620. Uh, the Baconian project sees the human male as above all else. And um, this is a, a um, result of our, of our having been created by God as in the image of God. And in the process of, as everyone knows, in the creation story, man falls also from grace and is banished from paradise. And in Bacon's uh, initiative and in, in Merchant's interpretation of this, the project of Western culture is to retake our place uh, in a perfect world. Uh, there is uh, another creation story, of course, and this has emerged in the uh, in post-war period uh, where we, we think of, of creation as a constant process of destruction and creation. In this, in this story, the universe seeks to cool itself off through using what are called dissipative structures, things like life, like living things like us, uh, hurricanes, um, ocean currents, and things like that, where we're trying to reduce the heat gradient. And in, um, in the way the Earth works, this, the constant flow of, of solar energy is captured by plants by the process of photosynthesis and makes it possible for complex being, living beings like you and me to live and to thrive. This leads us to a different view of, of the human, uh, to a, a place where the human is looked at as part of the web of life, as not the commanding, not the leader, right, but, but a, a citizen of the, of the complex of life. And if we don't um, move from the first story to the second story, I think we're in very, very difficult trouble because we, the notion that humans can master the earth and turn the earth universally to our purposes is one that I think is, is false and is perhaps leading to catastrophe, uh, perhaps will even be, be fatal. This is a uh, picture of our, one of our ancestors, or just a sketch of one of our ancestors. It's not nearly as uh, beautiful as Michelangelo's picture, but it's much, much more true than his. So w the situation we're in now is, is really very dire. This, this very disgusting painting by Goya is an image of, in my view, what we're doing. We're destroying the future. We're, we're eating our own children. We're destroying their future. We're, we're in the period that we now, many people, including me, call the Anthropocene, the era of the human domination of the planet. And there, there are lots of things that can, that can go wrong in this, during this time, which are going wrong, right? We, we, are, we exist already seeing significant sea level rise underway. We're seeing very massive fires and floods that are way out of the norm. And we're, we're looking at uh, the spread of desertification and, and other factors that are making it more, much more difficult for complex life to thrive on Earth. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a painting um, called The Drafting of the Declaration of Independence, and I really like this painting a lot. It, um, it shows uh, Thomas Jefferson drafting the, the de Declaration, and you can see that on the floor there are lots of scraps of paper, presumably where the mistakes in the drafting uh, occurred. But what I like about uh, this painting is that I think a lot of the mistakes stayed on the table, and a lot of, them, a lot of the mistakes are in the founding documents of the model nation, the United States. And these include the notions of property, sovereign, the sovereign person and the sovereign state, liberty, progress, and growth. And these are sort of the building blocks of our current culture, and I want to try to show why each of them is in some, some difficulty. So I'll start with property. Uh, one, one feature of, of the Judeo-Christian religion is that God gives the world to men and the sons of men, 
as a gift, and it is the, the, the duty of men to use that for their own purposes to improve the human well-being. Uh, but in, in, of course, the creation, the co-creation narrative, there is no giver, and so there's no gift. So with the notion of property has much less or even no support within the co-evolutionary co narrative. In addition, the property regime has allowed the wealthy nations to basically unilaterally take over the Earth's carbon, uh, carbon sinks, the, the atmosphere, to change the composition of the oceans and so forth. So it's, it's resulted in a very, very difficult, a very, very different uh, world as a result of this notion of fair appropriation, uh, or unfair appropriation, if you like. So there's another way, though, to think about the human-Earth relationship besides one of property, and it's been suggested by Thomas Berry, that we reject the notion that the, our relationship to the Earth is primarily one of use, and recognize that we can have a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship, which should be our goal. Uh, the second difficulty is the notion that we're sovereign people, that we're, we're in charge of our bodies and our property. This is a picture that could have been from the mass transit of Montreal, somebody sneezing in your face. And of course, what happens after this is pretty soon, you know, you're not feeling so great, the next day you have to stay home from work. But this is just one indication of this problem. Of, we're, we're surrounded by a sea of germs, and, of, um, <clears throat> and you know, we're embedded in Earth's energy and material fl flows. And um, the notion of that we're separate from the universe is really an illusion. It's a useful one, but it is, in fact, an illusion. So, in fact, uh, we're, we should think of ourselves not as sovereign people, but as embedded people. This is an idea of, within my second grade classroom, that the Earth is divided into nations, and that it is, um, excuse me, made up of nation states that are in control. But this is a true image of the world. The world is a single system of um, energy and material powered by the sun and by the rotation of the planet. And we have to move beyond the notion of nation states to an integrated understanding of how the Earth works and the fair shares uh, of it. Uh, this is another very problematical no notion, the idea of liberty, which uh, we take to be uh, the right to do whatever we want, provided it doesn't harm someone else. But in a world where the carbon sink is full, as we are, as it is now, there are no examples of this. Everything we do, particularly in energy-intensive cultures, harms other people. So we have to rethink liberty as part of, as subordinate to justice, as living in, the, in a modest room in the mansion of justice. This is another uh, an amazing painting. Um, it's called American Progress, and it's very, very revealing. Uh, because it imagines that progress is the removal of the lesser people, that human, that the Europeans are the dominant species, the dominant force, and we have a right to take over the whole world and to force other people and other species out of the way. So Carolyn Merchant was right. Uh, we can reconstruct paradise. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of the great things about paradise is that you can get Diet Coke and potato chips anytime you want, All right? So it's a wonderful, wonderful place. So um, will the university save us from our desperate situation? I think the answer to this is yes and no. Um, many of the disciplines in, taught in higher education in the institutions I've taught in are anchored in the, the Baconian narrative, in, in the notion of mastery of the earth. And um, there are a number of disciplines from which we take our norms, economics and finance, law, governance and ethics, which have had no systematic connection to the modern creation narrative, to the cosmological narrative of contemporary science. In, for example, economics has had no systematic connection to uh, Earth system science for over 200 years. Uh, so it's, it's replaced the, um, the notion of progress in, you know, that's the older notion, with a contemporary notion that growth is, is the goal, the principal goal of society. But um, this, is not, this is not succeeding. It's uh, overstretching the planetary limits. It's not producing fairness, and it has a number of other defects. 
But again, there's another way, right? We, can, we should embrace, in my view, a project which I call compassionate retreat. Uh, as in a battle that can't be won, right, you try to pull back in such a way that you do as little harm to your own troops and hopefully to the troops of others and tend to the material well-being of others uh, as you're doing this. Economics uh, and finance, this is, a, this is just a diagram, this is in a conventional uh, introductory economics book, uh, have, have no systematic connection to biophysical reality. In my hotel room, I have a plug and a wastebasket showing where energy comes from and where I can put things. But in this diagram, there's no, there's no connection to biophysical reality. Here's a, here again is a better way, another way. This is, what, this is a diagram that depicts ecological economics, where you see the economy as embedded in the Earth's biophysical systems and as subordinate to the rules of society. This is a much more promising framework and one, one that we use um, in the program I have at McGill. This is, um, well, this is a very famous uh, narrative that probably everybody knows of Narcissus, who's so infatuated with his own image that he doesn't pay attention to other uh, things that are attractive around him. Um, and this is, uh, this is what's happening at universities, right? We are so fascinated with our own thought systems, such as economics and finance, that we don't connect these, the, the teaching that we do, to the biophysical reality that's behind these these images and these concepts that we've come up with. So uh, we mislead uh, very, very large numbers of students every year, and then when they graduate, they, may, they sow mayhem in the world. So higher education's really got a big role in this, in this crisis that we're in, and, and one that's uh, very, very uh, difficult. So what should we do about higher education? Well, one is reject the narcissism and return to a, the reason that the universities exist, which is to study the universe and the human place in it. Recognize that, that the disembedded disciplines like economics and finance are essentially like infectious diseases. They just spread around from one, one thing to another, kind of taking over the conceptual apparatus of the system. We need to, in universities, we need to take responsibility for the harm that we have done in teaching things that are uninformed by uh, the best of contemporary science. And we should make the, uh, the reconciliation of the sciences and the social sciences a condition for further monetary support from individuals, foundations, and governance, governments. So we, we really have a, a way to have a, a fresh start where we can leave a lot of this debris behind us and think about uh, the human, human beings as... Um, not, not the chosen species, there is no chosen people, and there is no chosen gender. Human population growth is not an intrinsic good in the evolutionary paradigm. There is no divine mandate that humans own the earth. Then there is no exogenous rescue. There's no one who's going to come from somewhere else in the cosmos and save us from our folly. And there's no ex-cathedral moral system like the Ten Commandments where there's authority comes from outside the evolutionary system. Moral systems evolve within the evolutionary context and become part of that, part of the, the way in which the earth evolves. So uh, lastly, I'd, I'd just like to say a word about what citizenship means in this context. I'm informed by a book by James Carse called Finite and Infinite Games, where he distinguishes between finite games and infinite games. A finite game is like hockey or baseball, or soccer, where there's a set, set of rules, the point of the game is to win, uh, it has to be in a particular place at a particular time, and so forth. And Karst says, well, that's all fine, but there are also infinite games. And an infinite game, the point of the game is to keep the game going. My view is that the infinite game, the, the ultimate infinite game is evolution. And that if we're going to be responsible citizens in that game, we have to remember that the, our goal is to keep the game going. So, to do that, I, I think we have to rethink many of our concepts, some of which I've talked about just in this brief presentation. Well, one is we have to abandon the notion of property in favor of, of a mutually enhancing human-Earth relationship. We have to rethink both personal and national sovereignty, subordinate liberty to justice for all of life, and abandon the growth suicide pact um, that we're, we're in and begin a rapid and orderly compassionate retreat to me, this is the meaning of progress in the Anthropocene. Thank you. 
Right.